Hold on a second, hold on a second. You said kind of language, like feet held to the Maoist flames. And then I know that you talk a lot about polarization. Don't you think that's adding to the polarization, like you're talking about Mao and you're invoking this idea of fire, serious communism. Isn't that a little bit severe? I don't think it's any more severe than starting with the assumption that I'm part of the alt-right. Hey there, Mug Clubber and or YouTuber. We are introducing a new segment today. Uh, long form interview called Devil's Advocate, where we'll bring on the foremost conservative thinkers, critical thinkers, um, and try to present both points of view. I think it was my friend Owen who actually said, if you cannot argue your ideological opposition's point of view as effectively as they can, you have no business holding your own position. So the purpose of this format is to argue the left's, the progressive left's position more effectively than they do and to hopefully equip you in case you uh, will encounter these, these arguments, these lines of questioning, these specific um, uh, patterns of attack that you see from the left. So I, I warn you, you might get mad, you might get frustrated, you might want to beat up uh, Skylar. I know that I did. These do not represent my views at all or the views of anybody at Louder with Crowder unless I don't know about it. Enjoy Devil's Advocate with Dr. Jordan Peterson. Devil's Advocate with Skylar Turden. All right, I am your host, Skylar Turden. Uh, this is a segment where we take on the biggest right wing personalities uh, on the web, out there, sort of in the, in the cultural sphere and uh, challenge them, hold their feet to the fire to see if their ideas uh, hold water. And our next guest um, is a, a very popular, so very you know, noted fascist, super popular internet personality. Uh, you can take his personality quiz, I guess, at selfauthoring.com. His book is 12, year, 12 Rules for Life is available at places. Uh, Jordan Peterson, thanks for being on the show, sir. Thanks for the in invitation there, Skyler. Yes. Um, so let me allow you to sort of establish with people who aren't necessarily familiar. You've made it your main goal to be an advocate of, of free speech, um, particularly speaking out against restrictions thereof. I know it started, you sort of rose in notoriety with Bill C-16 in Canada. Um, tell us your, in your own words, why freedom of speech is so important and why you took your stand. Uh, with okay, well, for, first of all, I don't think that that's what I put myself forward as in, in, in the main. Okay. I'm right. actually very interesting, interested in the relationship between meaning and responsibility. Okay. And so um, I think that my books and my lectures are mostly devoted towards that. Um, I see free speech as necessary because it's part of the process by which the left and the right continue in an ongoing dialogue about how society should both maintain and update its structures and that any attempts to interfere with that are dangerous to both necessary wings, let's say. Okay. And in Canada, there was a bill passed a year ago in May, Bill C-16, which purported to do nothing but extend charter rights and certain protections under the criminal code to right. transgender people. And But I, that isn't how I looked at the legislation. I thought it was a piece of compelled speech. The justifications for doing that were very thin. Well, okay, let me let me ask you that. So first first off, okay, meaning and responsibility where they intersect, but freedom of speech is a big component to that, right? And that's why you talk about it. Well, it's a responsibility to speak properly, and it shouldn't be something that the government should um, interfere with. The government interferes with that at its peril, whether it happens to be left right. or right-leaning. Well, I just want to make sure I wasn't, you know, because you made it sound like I was misrepresenting you, but it's, it sounds like, no, that's, that's, that is a big part of it. So the thing with B, uh, uh, Bill C-16, right, um, you say that, I've read through the bill, I've not seen anything that specifically relates to compelled language. You often use that word, compulsion of language. Uh, I don't see it in there. That's because it was a particularly treacherous piece of legislation, and most of what was reprehensible about it was hidden in the surrounding documentation, mostly on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website. The federal government announced publicly before they took the link down that the bill would be interpreted in light of the documentation on the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which clearly made it um, uh, grounds, for, grounds for civil action, at least, and perhaps criminal action, to misgender someone, despite the lack of any norms uh, currently operating with regards to the use of gender pronouns, for example. 
and it also instantiated a social constructionist view of gender into Canadian law, which I thought was equally reprehensible, given that the scientific evidence is overwhelming that a substantial part of gender differences in biology and personality and temperament are biologically influenced, if not determined. Right. And I know then we can get into sort of this biological determinism. I know it's really popular with the alt-right in and, and, and that sphere. But it sounds to me like what you just said, before we move on to, to more freedom of speech and, and the meat of some of your other topics that you discuss, sounds to me like you're talking about a potential interpretation of the law provincially. But that's not what the law said. And considering that's like the catalyst for you, here is this rock star on the right. Don't you think that's, that's a little important? I don't think that there would have been inclusions within the law of changes to the criminal code if the intent wasn't much broader. And, it, you, you know, the law was only about a paragraph long, and so the surrounding documentation is of crucial importance. And if the federal government was um, playing straight with regards to the origin of the law and how was it going to be interpreted, they wouldn't have taken down the link that had um, made the claim quite straightforwardly that it was going to be interpreted in light of the Ontario Human Rights Commission's already extant policies which surrounded similar legislation at the provincial level. Besides, it played out exactly the way I thought it would play out, for example, at Wilfrid Laurier University, where a teaching assistant was held to the, had her feet held to the Maoist flames for daring to show a video uh, expressing my views. Um, to a communications class. No, you use so, that no, kind of I don't think like I use that kind of language, like feet held to the Maoist flames. And then I know that you talk a lot about polarization. Don't you think that's adding to the polarization, like you're talking about Mao and you're invoking this idea of fire, serious communism? Isn't that a little bit severe? I don't think it's any more severe than starting with the assumption that I'm part of the alt-right, which is a white supremacist organization and uh, an, an identity politics who said, group. Who said you were part right. of the alt-right? I didn't say you were part of the alt-right. Yeah, you did, actually. You could just rewind the tape. No, I mentioned that it was popular it's, in alt-right circles, and you happen to be popular in alt-right circles. Listen, I if see. I happen to well, be popular at universities, and they show, you know, I'm not responsible for what those professors say. I'm just saying it's your views. Would you disagree happen to coincide with the views of a lot of the alt-right? Yeah, I would disagree. Okay. I don't think they agree with the alt-right at all. In fact, I have some very pronounced enemies on the alt-right, and they've come out and said exactly that, because I've said in multiple public appearances that I'm no fan of collectivists. I don't really care if they're on the left or on the right. It's equally reprehensible as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well... So there's just two different ways of playing identity politics. There's a left-wing way and a right-wing way, and I'm not a favor, in favor of either of them. Yeah. So I think any attempt whatsoever to associate me with the alt-right, regardless of whether you know, you have an opinion that I have followers there is merely an attempt to sure, sure. And integrate I what I'm saying by association. Well, I don't want to, I don't want, listen, that's not what, it, what I'm trying to, I was mentioning it, it is popular, these are popular in the alt-right circle, but they do disagree What's with you. What's your evidence for that? But they, No, you're right, they do disagree with you, and largely because you're, you know, Canadian, that's a bit, there's a split there with American alt-right and, and, and Canada. But let me, let me go back to what you were just talking about here. Um, Sort of you mentioned biology. Now, let's say that we, I agree with you, right, biology, and it's a big determining factor in, in gender. Let's, for the sake of argument, like gender and sex are the same thing. Um, I'm assuming, obviously, you haven't really familiarized yourself with Simone de Beauvoir or Judith Butler, but that's cool. So, familiar enough. Familiar, well, yeah, okay, familiar enough. And that's the danger Especially with a lot with of Judith people. Butler. Yeah, well, that's the danger with a lot of people. They're only familiar enough. But let's assume that it's as correct, um, okay, and that uh, biology determines gender. I don't think we would disagree that transgenders have been the victim of hate crimes at a disproportionate rate. And this is the complication that I think a lot of, a lot of right-wingers miss. They see it, uh, they, they, they're very reductive. You know, permitting absolute freedom of speech, it silences other people's free speech because it allows people to vo bully victims into silence. Um, and, and then you have freedom of speech, if it's blanketed, actually reduces the totality of free speech because of minorities who are afraid to speak out. Is that a problem that you agree with? Well, there's no doubt that speech can be misused and commonly is. The question isn't, that isn't the issue. The issue is who's going to regulate it. And the, the answer to that is minimal regulation because it's such a fundamental part of the ability to think and orient yourself in the world. And so it's perfectly reasonable to point out that free speech can be abused and has been in the past, but then the, the devil's in the details right. say, well, it's, it's been used to oppress minorities while also to free them, we might point out. The left wing was a, a tremendous advocate for free speech right up until, I would say, five or six years ago, partly because 
People who are oppressed need free speech above all else to make their claims heard. I mean, that, that's always but been that's the not, fundamental But that's case. not how it's playing it's out. Right. That's well, not it's how it's not playing. how it's playing out for five years. I don't know what the hell that has to do on the broader, broader scheme of things. You can be sure that any restrictions that the left manages to put on, on free speech will immediately be co-opted by the right. So it's an extraordinarily foolish game. And, then that's, and there's an issue that's even deeper than that, which is, well, we've already agreed that speech can be, uh, let's say, harsh and divisive and oppressive, all of those things. Who's going to regulate it? Who's, who, whose hands are you going to put that power in? Well, here's the thing. Well, I think you, you do this a lot, and people, people on the right do this a lot, where they sort of act like this government is this far-off entity who makes these decisions in Washington, D.C. Listen, it's us, right? We're, we're, we're a democracy uh, here in the United States. People vote in their representatives. So the government is us. I pay my taxes. I get uh, water that comes from my tap at the same speed as uh, I get access to the freeways as anyone else. We do agree, when we live in a society, that a government has uh, certain control. I mean, we don't complain about other regulations, and this is where I think... We complain about any regulation that transgresses con constitutional rights, and the right to free speech is probably the primary right, at least in the U.S. Okay, but... So like, it's also like, the right upon which the entire government edifice is built, and to say that you can elect, uh, elect representatives who are going to regulate free speech ignores the fact completely that you don't have an absolute democracy, you have a constitutional democracy. Well, these same regulators, so they're, are, they're in charge of what can be, they're in charge of what can be uh, said as far as libel laws with the press. So we do have a freedom of the press, but we do have actual libel laws. There are regulations on firearms, right? You don't think that you should be able to go off and own a tank. So uh, again, these are constitutional amendments. Uh, libel laws, like we discussed, those would fall under freedom of the press, the First Amendment, with freedom of speech. Why? Uh, I think the restrictions that are placed on free speech are already plenty sufficient okay. and to extend them to any degree is a, is a very big mistake and besides there's a huge difference with regards to compelled speech i should point out that the your american supreme court in the 1940s made compelled speech unconstitutional so canada passed a law that would be clearly unconstitutional in the united states it was also a law passed at the federal and provincial level because it compelled speech that had absolutely no precedent in english common law because there's a difference between saying what people can't say, sure. and so that's libel, and saying what they have to say, which is compelled speech. And the Supreme Court said very explicitly in the United States that it was a mistake both, both on the part of restricting the speaker and restricting the listener to compel people to utter words with which they did not agree. Now, there's certain exceptions for commercial law, but there are no exceptions in non-commercial speech. And so, so to bring in libel law and that sort of thing is complete red herring. Well, hold on. I want to be sure because you just mentioned red herring here. You say, so you're, I want to make clear that I understand. Your problem is with compelled speech then, correct? Not saying what you can't say, but forcing people what, as, as to what they well, can. Well, I also, I'm absolutely no fan whatsoever of hate speech legislation, but that's, which is, which is uh, I suppose, the logical extension of laws attempting to restrict what you can't say. Right. So I think hate speech laws are dreadful, and I think they're being misused all the time, and that we've only seen the beginning of that. But the issue of compelled speech is worse than the issue of regulating hate speech, because it, it requires people to utter words that they did not formulate and may not believe. So it violates freedom of conscience. It violates the uh, responsibility that each individual has to only say things they believe to be true and representative of their viewpoint. It interferes with their ability to think and communicate, and it makes them terrified of, of potential, potentially terrified of government and other organizational intervention. Well, people are terrified so, right now because the First Amendment was written long before social media and Facebook, and so now the speech is very invasive. You used to be able to turn it off, now you can't. We'll come back to that because I know we have a lot of topics to get into, and you know, as in your words, you're not just an advocate of free speech, but the, the sort of where meaning intersects with responsibility. Uh, you just brought up hate speech laws, so I think it's a good transition. Uh, Jordan, do you support equality? Uh, it's, a, that's a trick, it's a trick question, so how about you specify it a little bit more clearly before I answer that? Okay, do you support uh, equality of race, gender, sexual orientation? Same, same objection applies. Define equality. Equality of opportunity, for sure. Equality, equality of treatment. Of, not the least. Again, it's it's insufficiently defined question. Okay. Equality of treatment. All right. Equality of opportunity, for sure. I think that any any bureaucratic structure that's set up that doesn't allow each person to be assessed on the basis of their merits in relationship to the, a, a particular function, like a job, 
uh, is, a, is a big mistake for everyone involved, including the individuals that are unreasonably discriminated against. So, sounds like a, sounds like a long way around to say to say uh, no. Let me ask you this: You've spoken out against the problem of free speech uh, in regards to speakers, specifically on campus, universities, people being um, censored on social media. Let me ask you that: Is is that even a question like of, of speakers, for example, on campus? Is it a question of free speech at all? Isn't that just a private entity refusing? Uh, to serve an individual whose message they don't agree with, not hosting them? Well, it's certainly not the case in Canada because their universities are public. Okay. And, it's all, and that's also the case in many universities in the United States. So, and then with regards to the private ent entities, I suppose it depends on why they're doing it and, and under what pressure they're operating. I mean, a typical trick now is to, um, is to, to, charge the, the, the individuals who are coming to campus outrageous security fees to prevent them from being able to speak. So there's plenty of, of what would you call it? There's, there's plenty of lack of fair play at work in those sorts of situations. So you're, you're, and I think universities above all should be, should be cautious about restricting who's allowed to speak on campus for ideological reasons. Oh, I, I agree. I think they should be super careful. Um, so I want to make sure that you're, so you only have a problem, not with private universities, but public universities. I didn't say I didn't have a problem with private universities okay, doing well, it. I said it's clearly, it's clearly the, a problem with public universities doing it. With private universities, there is that additional element that you just described. Okay. Uh, so would you compel public universities to host speakers they disagree with? define compel force them to host speakers they disagree with i would encourage them to leave speakers alone if if student organizations invite them onto campus then the university should do what it can to keep ideology out of the picture and to allow them to speak right so public university is saying okay uh for us, Jordan Peterson is aligned because, you know, because of his misgendering of people and his anti-trans, so to speak, or some of his, his uh, uh, whatever you want to use it, you know, homophobic, uh, anti-left-wing rhetoric, and then uh, another university... Well, that's a typical example of exactly why it's very dangerous to let ideologues determine where the free speech line is drawn, because, you know, in formulating that question, you used a whole string of unwarranted epithets that you drew, drew from very badly conducted press interviews to characterize my viewpoints. And so, just by formulating the question the way you did, you indicated how terribly dangerous it is to allow committees of ideologues to determine who should be able to allow, who should be allowed to speak and on what topic. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, First off, you're, you're, are you saying you don't see yourself as having spoken any anti-transgender rhetoric at all? No. Really? It has nothing to do with transgender. It has nothing to do with transgender individuals. It has to do with compelled speech. Okay. The so, fact that it, it happened to involve a bill that involved transgender people was more, a, an, I would say, an accident. That was the, okay. that was the issue that brought this to rise. So, so, so you use the gen people's preferred pronouns then? I'll, I haven't, and it would depend on how I was asked. It would depend on which pronouns, and it would depend on what I thought their motivation for requiring them was, and it would depend on whether they demanded it and all of that. So at the moment, I, I'm very disinclined to do it because now I have to do it. I'm legally compelled to do it in Canada, and that's enough reason for me to say no. Well, it sounds to me like there you said that you gave a lot of depends for someone who believes. In, yeah, that's for sure. And you don't have a right. For, you don't have the right to determine how I dress you. Well, you don't have the right to deny their reality, to deny who they are, how they identify. Why? So that's the then. I deny. I deny people's reality all the time by disagreeing with them. So, and they do the same to me. And you have every right to deny someone's reality. That's that's the whole basis of your ability to think independently. Is that you get to define reality one way, and other people get to define it another way. And then hopefully you negotiate a shared reality that you can both live in peacefully. Well, that's my so point. So that's a completely specious argument. Well, no, that's my point. Is because for someone who does talk about moral absolutism to some degree, um, uh, you know, in this case there are a lot of depends. And uh, for example, if a black guy said, "Hey, I'm black," you can just say, "No, you're not." And then can you use racial epithets or what he considers racial epithets? I mean, this to, because people in the trans I mean, community. Can I? Of course, I can. Whether I should or not is a different issue, and whether or not it should be illegal is a completely different issue. 
So whether I can and whether illegal. I should are not the same thing. No, it's not. It's illegal it's to, go out and, to go out and to, if a black guy repeat, if you, to call him the N word, that would be illegal. It's, illegal. Harassment. it's harassment if you continually do it. It's not the illegal. Stop. It's not illegal in the United States. Well, okay, I agree to disagree on that one because it's, there's no disagreeing about it. it's not illegal. Yeah, well, go see how that works if you go on down to Spanish Harlem. On uh, just be sure to upload it with a GoPro. I didn't so. say that you should do it, and I didn't right. say that it was right, but I did say that it was legal. Well, yeah, I know, and that's the, that's that's kind of the bait and switch that you pull, uh, Jordan, quite a bit. Is you say, well, I didn't say it was legal, I didn't say it was right. What do you think is right? Let me ask you this. Let me ask Laserin. What do you think is right as far as how to gender somebody who uh, is, identifies who has been abused, who's been the victim of hate crimes their whole life, and wants to be referred to uh, by their specific pronouns? What do you think is right? I Let's think that your attempt to use hypothetical compassion for someone hypothetically oppressed is an appalling way to defend a compelled speech law. Mm, yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, cause because it puts, think about what that does. It puts you completely in the driver's seat, doesn't it? You get to sit there and think, well, I'm a compassionate, wonderful person with the me essential mien of a saint, and this person who's addressing me is obviously entirely corrupt because they don't have the same moral compassion for the oppressed that I do. It's like I'm not even going to engage in that. It's, it's an appalling way of arguing. What, what makes you think that you're so compassionate? What makes you think that you've got all the right on your side? Because I'm the only so you don't think there's anything dangerous about uh, the government attempting to produce compelled speech legislation on the back of hypothetical compassion? You can't see any way that would go wrong? Well, I'll talk about you. Then you're not thinking. You just talk That's about That's what's gone wrong many times in the past. You and you're using your, your mask of compassion and care for the oppressed to justify whatever actions you want to undertake. All right, listen, I let you go here. You talk in paragraphs around circles. Now you're misrepresenting me. I didn't say that at all. I didn't say that I don't see any problems with it. I think I'm the only one in this interview. You haven't pointed out any problems with it so far. Well, I'm, also the, I'm also the only one who hasn't condemned compassion in any way, shape, or form. And I'll yeah, Compassion needs to be condemned in many, many ways because people use it as an unthinking marker for moral virtue, and I it's not that at all. I understand that it can be subjectively condemned, but I'm saying there's one of us here who has advocated it as a virtue, and I think you'd do well to include that in your rhetoric. This is an opinion. Yeah, well, I don't buy the idea that compassion is a virtue. And I don't I think, think that it should be arbitrary. Sense. I'm talking about people with, deg well, again, the government is, these are elected officials, and we elect the most qualified people for the job. You cannot elect someone who's the most qualified for the job and then decide that they don't have the authority that you've granted them as a yes, voter. Yes, you can. That's what a constitution is for. That is what it comes to. So yes, you absolutely for. can. That's the the Constitution puts limits on the on the power of the elected representatives, and partly that's to protect the rights of minorities. And one of the most fundamental rights that minorities have is the right to free speech. It's absolutely unbelievable that the left, who hypothetically are standing up for the for the rights of the oppressed, are are daring to challenge the supremacy of free speech because it's been the fundamental weapon that people who are dispossessed have used against power structures since since the beginning of 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 the right itself so it's unbelievably short-sighted and if you think that the restrictions on free speech that are being put in place by the left won't be misused by the right then you're not thinking well, at all you know you keep saying that the constitution has changed some people think that income tax is unconstitutional do you think income tax is unconstitutional you think we have to completely do away with income tax because we have amendments that deal with that the point is it's a living breathing document right and the people who have been uh, given granted that it's authority. not living and breathing as much as the radicals who wish to transform it according to their ideology think it is so, and you mess with constitutional amendments at your peril. Okay, so... You know, the whole idea here, the, the fundamental, what would you call it, the fundamental assumption of this whole line of questioning is that your particular ideological stance puts you firmly on the side of the dispossessed, and that makes you admirable and correct. And first of all, I don't buy the argument that you're on the side of the dispossessed merely because you say you do. The fact that you're, you're a arguing white man. for limitations... Just the fact that you're arguing for limitations on free speech indicates to me that you're no friend whatsoever of people who are truly dispossessed. So, but those people, dis those people disagree with you more than me. I mean, how many, how many minorities really are lining up for Jordan Peterson? I, right? Well, I mean, that, that's a rhetorical question, and there's plenty of people who are so-called minorities that are coming to my talks, for example. You don't have any hard data on that. So, so okay, it's something like 90%, over 90% of black Americans vote Democrat. It's not even close. Latino Americans, Asian Americans, it's, it's not even close. It's 80 or above for every single demographic. So the point is, right, I, I don't want to speak for minorities, and I know you don't want to speak for minorities. 
but they agree with my stance a lot more. That's how they vote. So it's clear they don't have a problem with a guy like me. And I'm not saying that I'm inherently right. That that um, uh, all I'm trying to point out is that I think maybe you're not consistent on freedom of speech. Let me. Okay, let's ask this. This just happened this week. Facebook, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, right? They all banned the Infowars channel. So let me ask yep. you: Do you think that's a good thing or that's a bad thing? No, I think it's a catastrophe. Okay. So what's your what's your solution? Do you believe Facebook or YouTube should be forced to provide a platform for speech that they detest? No, I don't think they should be forced. I think that they're I think that they've they've bit off far more than they'll be able to chew. How so? Because now they've decided well now they've decided that they're ethically responsible for the content on their platforms. So good luck with that decision because they have an awful lot of content and drawing the lines is going to be extraordinarily di difficult thing to do. So basically, the way that these companies were set up to begin with is that people could post content and then other people could watch it and basically decide by their viewing, um, they could value the content by their proclivity to view. Mm. And now they've decided as a consequence of this decision that they're going to be in the business of arbitrarily determining what should and shouldn't be presented for public viewing. And they'll never run out of decisions to make. You know, lots of people who were watching Alex Jones didn't agree with him. They were just keeping an eye on him. So like I watched Alex Jones from time to time because I wanted to see what the radical conspiratorial right wing was up to. Right. And yeah. now that's not possible. Now they're driven underground. Way to cover your tracks with your browser history. I appreciate there's, it. There's, um, let me ask you there's, this. Yeah, go there's ahead. going to be all sorts of lines that they have to decide now. So are they going to take out Paul Joseph Watson next? Lawrence Southern? I mean, are they, where are well, they going to draw if, the line what, exactly? Okay, so if it's against their terms of service, isn't it within their domain to revoke the channel? What's what's the solution? Of course it is. I didn't say they couldn't do it. I said it was a bad idea. Okay, so you're not... That's not the same thing. Okay. So you don't have a. So I think it's. Go ahead. Well, I think I think that they've. I really do believe, and I'm sad about this. I do believe that they've bitten off more than they can chew, and that it's going to be, it's it's it's, one small. It's a it's a warning sign with regards to these, media conglomerates that are attempting to produce large scale public discourse, because now they've taken on they've taken the role of censor onto themselves, and they'll find that that's a never ending role that produces endless trouble. They, they've got themselves into endless trouble as far as I'm concerned. And for, as a, from a perspective of a clinical psychologist, I would also say um, the worst thing you can do to someone who's paranoid, the most ill-advised thing you can do to someone who's paranoid is persecute them. Yeah. So now that, I mean, Alex Jones is always talking about, the little I know about him, he's always talking about uh, conspiracies of one form or another. And now what has all the appearance of a conspiracy between four or five very large media conglomerates is aimed squarely at him. So all the people who are watching him who are conspiracy minded and somewhat paranoid are going to think, well, Jones must be onto something because otherwise these big conglomerates wouldn't have clamped down on him. No. It's a very, very bad idea. And millions of people watch him. So well, these are people who censored. thought these are people who thought that Podesta had an underage sex ring in a pizza parlor. So I don't really think that this is necessarily the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, it sounds to me. Are, do, so I want to make sure that I clarify. Are you not amongst the, the people who believe that uh, these big platforms like YouTube, Facebook should be treated like public utilities? Because there are a lot of right wingers who do believe that, like phone. Yeah, I think they should be treated as public utilities because otherwise they can't exist. Because there's no possible way that these corporations can handle monitoring the, their content. There's too much content. So then, they'll, 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 run, they'll run out of manpower to make the decisions. I mean, what, okay, so Alex Jones is now being banned. What do you think about people who've interviewed Alex Jones? Should they be banned? That would include Joe Rogan, for example, because he interviewed Alex Jones. Yeah. So should we ban him? Well, and if not, why not? So you think that Facebook, YouTube, Google, these companies that, you know, basically start up in garages, these tech startups, invest millions of dollars and they grow to become successful. And uh, then you support the government stepping in in an authoritarian fashion and telling them who they have to allow on their platforms? I didn't say the government should step in. I said that they made a mistake by deciding to act as censors and that they'll pay for it. I didn't say anything about anybody stepping in and changing it. I said it was a mistake. Well, if they're to be treated like public utilities, then that would be the government stepping in and changing because right now they're not. Well, if they were to be treated as public utilities, that would be a transformation in the way they were regulated. So that really doesn't have anything to do specifically with the Alex Jones issue. Well, I'm just I don't saying you would support it. You would support okay. it. Okay, let's, that seems... let's reverse the question because okay. I'm the one having to come up with all the complex answers. All right. Okay. So how would you propose that these complex corporations decide which content is acceptable? 
Uh, exactly. No. How would you propose that? Exactly. I would propose it. I don't think there does yeah. need to be a proposal. I mean, I think this is where actually I would be on your side. Let the free market decide. And the free market is YouTube and Facebook. And if they don't want to host content, I don't think they should be forced to host content. I don't think they should be compelled to host content. Well, obviously, they shouldn't be. That That's not the issue. The issue is how are they going to go about making the decisions? And how are we going to be sure that that won't go dreadfully wrong? I mean, obviously, it's the case that censorship can go wrong. You certainly see that in places like China. Once you start with censorship, how do you know, how do you have any idea how are you going to put proper boundaries around it and decide who's acceptable? You're either going to let your listeners decide that or you're going to decide it. And then you're going to find out that you've taken on a huge weight of decision making that you can't handle. Or Maybe you, I'm wrong. Maybe that won't happen. But it's certain, certainly I would be very loath to decide what needs to be censored because the number of decisions I'd have to make would multiply beyond end. Well, I'm not saying let any specific individual decide. I'm saying let the free market decide. If people don't want uh, Alex Jones on YouTube, then YouTube doesn't have to provide it. If people watching YouTube don't. I already agreed that YouTube doesn't have to provide it. I said it was a mistake to engage in censorship. Sure. Just because people are allowed to do something doesn't mean it isn't a mistake upon occasion. So I'm not asking for government regulation. And the idea that transforming these corporations into something approximating utilities would be a form of regulation is really, a, and, and what would you say, it's an ill-formed way of posing the question. It's a matter of classification. Do you think that Alex Jones should be able to use a phone? Well, I do think Alex Jones should be able to use a phone as long as he pays for it, as long as a phone company wants to offer him their services. Right, so the phone company offers everyone equal access to the services, regardless of content. And I presume you'd object if the phone service started to decide that conversations shouldn't be allowed to occur. And so it, it, you can make a reasonable argument that these large-scale media distribution companies play the same role, but on a larger scale. It's not necessarily the case that it's uh, an argument without flaw, but it's a reasonable argument. But I don't think that there's any real alternative. I don't see how companies like Facebook and YouTube can possibly police their content yeah. without producing far more trouble than they'll save. That's the issue. Well, I'm not so much just concerned about them policing the content. What I'm concerned with is, let's say we do the, so the public utility sort of option, right? Um, what I'm concerned with is the free market will be able to provide alternatives. You know, Alex Jones can go there. If we believe, if we're consistent, we believe in freedom of speech and the freedom of market as it applies thereof, we should be free to accept, we should believe, follow this down the logical trail that uh, there will be an alternative well, platform for Alex yeah, Jones there or will you. Be. There prob yes, there probably will be. And that's also why I think it was a mistake for these companies to engage in the censorship, because I think that they're signing their own death warrant by doing so. It'll probably take 10 years to unfold, but it's a big mistake. And yeah. so that is what yeah. will happen is because people will stop trusting YouTube and Facebook and so forth to provide uncensored access to content. And as a consequence, other forms of, of information distribution will emerge. So it's, that's why I thought it was a bad decision from a corporate perspective. Okay. They had every right to make it, but I think it's a bad decision. If I were to, if I were to walk into your house, okay? If I were to walk into your house right now and just and harass you and, and call you all sorts of names and get right up in your face and not leave after you've asked me to leave and continue uh, harassing you uh, without any, without any, any uh, refuge for you, would you think that that is a crime for me to do that? I don't know why you're asking the question. So well, let me tell you why I'm asking. So now, again, this is why we talk about the Constitution in guns. Now I have fully automatic AR-15s and things change, right? Times change. We need to adapt. And we've both agreed on that to some extent. Now online, people like Alex Jones, they have the ability to invade your house digitally, continually, and harass and berate. They can like, always shut it off. Not necessarily. That's the thing. You can't. You can't shut off everything. You can't block people. You can't mute people on every platform. Then they can have your email on YouTube. You you know it shows up in your suggested feed. The point is, especially. No, that's a silly argument. You can just shut the whole thing off if you want. So it's a silly argument. It's not like someone invading your house. So because you can shut it off at any time. Okay. Well, so if, no, that's just not that's just not going anywhere. That argument. Well, what if someone has a computer in their house then? If they have a computer in their house, then it means that someone can invade their, their house that way digitally. There's, there's no cannot... way to find a space away from these, particularly people like Alex Jones, most egregious offenders, right, who spread conspiracies and effectively, like, lead to doxing of people. Um, I mean, that's just... Well, a lot of this, the thing is, too, it's, again, again, the, the, the question is more fundamental. Let's assume that it's a bad idea for poorly supported conspiracy theories to be formulated and distributed. Yeah, let's assume that. 
yeah, fine. Well, we don't need to put it in air quotes. We could probably both assume it. The question is, what should you do with people who are doing that? And the, the one answer is, well, do what you can to silence them and drive them underground. <clears throat> the other is, let them talk and let people make up their own minds. And my sense is, and is that people are wise enough to listen to people of that sort and decide that that's too extreme. Now, not everyone, because conspiracy theorists can find followers among people who are disagreeable and somewhat paranoid, but it's best for everyone, including the conspiracy theorists themselves, that those things are aired in public discussion because it helps keep people sane. You know, like I've known people who are I a little disagree. bit on this. I disagree. Yeah, but that's because you don't know what you're talking about. No, I think I've you're known incorrect. Listen, there are more Americans who believe in angels than in climate change. Uh, the top shows of the Kardashians, look at what's on television. I don't believe that the American public, that anyone should be uh, granted the it's same... It's not the issue. Yeah, it is. You it said that they, the should be, they should be wise. They treat, should treat them wise enough. I'm saying I don't think they're wise enough, and that's why they're the wise is. enough compared to the alternatives. Okay. You know, your system in the United States was never set up under the presumption that the people were wise. It was set up under the presumption that the people, regardless of their wisdom, had the right to self-determination, and even more importantly, that although the people themselves might not always be wise, there isn't a better source of authority than the people themselves. Mm. So that no matter how corrupt and foolish the people happen to be, whatever systems you put in place to supplant them will be worse. And well, so I think that, and, and you might not believe that, but th and that's fine. But that is the founding principle of no, the I American don't believe system. It. I don't believe it. No, that's fine. You don't, I don't have believe to believe it. I don't believe that. I don't believe that Alex Jones and anyone with a Facebook page is, for example, as qualified and uh, and as safe for the American public as Walter Cronkite or people in the Senate and House who are uh, qualified to make these determinations. I don't. That's just a disagreement. But I'll let people, you know, let it's the... not just a diff disagreement. It's actually a disagreement about the fundamental structure of the entire political system because you think that it's possible to produce banks of experts of one sort or another who can supplant the fundamental w will of the people. And I don't think, I think that that's a very bad idea. And I think that history shows that that's a bad idea. At least with democracy, it tends to be self-correcting. So if people make egregious errors, they correct them in the next election. Well, okay. And so... Sorry, I want to. I want to give you a so again. That is selfauthoring.com. If people want to take your quiz and the book Twelve Rules for Life is uh, available at places. Um, so let me. Uh, final question: Do you ever, does it ever concern you that you might be on the wrong side of history? What mostly concerns me is whether I make a mistake when I'm talking, and so I, I'm. I'm not thinking about the wrong side of history precisely. So. It does it concern you that me that I might be making mistakes? That concerns me all the time. But um, I thought most, I thought the things that I say through very carefully, and you know, I'm perfectly willing to live or die by them. Let's say so. Um, well, I ask you that because you know we've gone through a litany of, of, of you know using people's preferred pronouns, uh, the idea of compassion, um, neither of which do you support, and then we've gone through things like Alex Jones and extremists and social media, and these are ideas that you, do you. I wonder if you're constantly finding yourself defending just bad like bad people, and even if you're not one, if you have mostly what I find myself doing is um, being supported by a very large number of people and being, um, what would you call, put on the spot in various uncomfortable ways by a tiny, noisy m minority of l radical collectivists. So mm. that's mostly what I feel, yeah. or mo mostly what I experience. Isn't so, it, isn't it your long buddy, side of history, Isn't it your buddy Shapiro who says facts don't care about your feelings? So if you, that's how you feel, I'm sorry, that's not my intent here. Uh, but again, that is selfauthoring.com, 12 rules for life. Uh, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, thanks for taking the time. Um, you know, I, listen, man, I mean, you have, you have your point of view and I have mine. And, uh, I mean, there it is. Hey, if you like this video, subscribe, but that doesn't really mean a whole lot. So you can hit the notification bell. I know that uh, Skylar was incredibly, uh, unpleasant with Dr. Jordan Peterson. I wanted to kick his ass. So I get it. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, join Mug Club, or watch one of these other videos that could be playing in a box somewhere. Uh, maybe YouTube's banned it at this point. Who knows? Who knows?